Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Tonight is 13 of um, Jumadul Ula 1439. We are starting chapter 51 from uh, the uh, commentary of Kitab al Tawheed by Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimahullah. <coughs> and uh, chapter 51 starts with the verse of Surah Al Araf, verse number 180, translated in English as, And all the most beautiful names belong to Allah, so call on Him by them, and leave the company of those who belie or deny or utter impious. Uh, speech against his names. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ala min tabi'a hudaun ila yawm al-deen. Indeed, all praise to Allah and my peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This chapter is with the starting of the verse like so many chapters before. It starts with a verse. And which are verses in Surah Al-A'raf and it talks about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> and the attributes of His. It says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ The value that belong to Allah is the beautiful names. فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Call upon Him those names. So, the Tawheed as we have understood from the beginning is the three categories. Tawheed al-Ibadah, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and Tawheed al-Asma'u al-Sifat. Tawheed al-Asma'u al-Sifat is actually to affirm to Allah and single him with whatever is being confirmed and affirmed by the Almighty or his Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from the names and the attributes <coughs> without tamfil, that is anthropomorphism or takhif or giving an example of it or how it looks or alteration and negation. So if you, for example, reinterpret a name or a verse or a, an attribute to mean not, not the meaning of it, then actually you have uh, dysfunctioned it. You have not given it the right. So for example, if you said uh, Allah descends, you say descendants is his rahmah, his mercy. So you have actually dysfunctioned Allah the Almighty from going down. And his descendants is that suitable to his majesty. That's all we need to do is that we affirm the names and the attributes that Allah had affirmed for himself. Where his Prophet وسلم, had affirmed for him in an authentic hadith without any uh, giving an example. That is, there's no anthropomorphism, that means that he does not look like his creation, and does not, we don't give him a how, how it is, because we don't know how, how, how we don't, there is a how, but we don't know how, and also without alteration, and also without negation. Alteration means that you don't really alter the attribute to mean something else, or negation is to deny it. So it's got no meaning for you. And those who are Jahmiyyah and the Ghulaf and the Mu'tazila, they are the ones who have negated the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. And that is why the Jahmiyyah, some of the scholars, take them out of the 72 groups who are from the Hellfire to be our Kuffar. Because the 72 who are in the Hellfire, except for one which is in paradise, are all of them from the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Allah starts with this verse, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ We have discussed the names of Allah in a number of places, I think mainly in two places, not far, not far long. If we go to a chapter, which is the chapter we discussed, it, chapter 47, and it says the respect to the names of Allah, in which we discuss everything to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names, are they to be the same or they are to be different? Like Allah, Sami, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, we discussed also, are these names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or is it to somebody else? Can we name somebody, for example, Ar-Rahman? We said no. Can we put somebody as an example, Rahim? Yes. But we're not looking at the attribute. When we say his name is Rahim, is Rahim as a name. We don't look at the name Rahim as merciful, because we don't really look at him as a merciful. He could be a wicked person, but his name is Rahim. Whereas Allah's name is all of it, Mushtaqah, meaning, it implements the meaning of it. So when we say Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Khaliq, Al-Razib, Al-An, Al-Alim. So this is, those the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they implement and entail a meaning, which is the meaning of an attribute of Asma' Husna. Also we said regarding the names that they are not limited to any particular number. Some of the names we don't know, which Allah had 
kept to himself, and we said also that the names that we know are more than the 99 mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari Muslim. And we said that the hadith talks about he who man ahsa, lillahi tis'atan wa tis'ina ism. Lillahi, for very, inna lillahi tis'atan wa tis'ina ism. Why to Allah belong 99 names? Man ahsaha, akhara jannah. Who does ihsa to it, akhara jannah. And we said that ihsa means three things. To know the meaning and the wording. It's not to memorize. To know the meaning and the wording of that name. That particular name. And to secondly, to call Allah okay, with that name. That's as well from the word Ahsa. And the third one is to worship Allah through that name. So if you knew that he is merciful, then you are, when you ask in Allah, Oh, you are the merciful, have mercy upon me. Oh, you are the, for the forgiving, forgive me. So you understand it, meaning and wordings, and you call upon Allah with it. Ya Allah, Ya Ghafoor, Ya Rahman, Ya Al Jalal, Ya Al Ikram. And also you worship Allah through that name. So if you say you are the Samia, the one who you are uh, as well hear, hear the thing that we you know beyond our hearing. You are the all hearing. So Fatuluhu Biha. The ayah says, call upon him with those names. And this call, always we said, is two types. Call of worship, dua wa ibadah, and the call of request, dua wa mas'ala. The dua wa mas'ala is that when you call him, you call him with the, the tongue, Allahumma anta rahim anta al-ghafoor, anta al-razzaq, ya dal jalali wal ikram. This is, so you are using the names as a request, and also, you are using the name of to ibadah. So when you say, Ya Ar-Razzaq, Ya Al-Jalali Wal-Ikram, Ya Khaliq, so Ya Wahid, Ya Ahad, also I'm calling him with ibadah. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, He says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said to you, مُدْعُونِي, مُدْعُونِي, call upon me, and I will respond to you. Then He said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَةِ He the ones who are pride and arrogant not to make ibadah. So he called the supplication to be what? Ibadah. So, we don't say that there is no benefit if you call upon Allah's name and you don't understand the meaning of it. But this is not the way that Allah wants us to worship. He wants us to know the meaning of Allah, the Razzaq, al Bunan, the Rahman, the Rahim, the Most Beneficent, the Omnipotent, the Latif, the Khabir, the Dar, the Nafi'. So Allah doesn't just want us to know names which are empty of attributes. He wants us to learn as well the names and what they entail. So when we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names, it means two things. That is dua al-ibadah and the dua al-mas'ala. So in dua al-ibadah, that is you worship Allah through that name. And also it's dua al-mas'ala to request Allah. So you are... Be, uh, putting Allah's name in, uh, as, as, uh, 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 every time you want to call upon Him. So you want to call upon Him, you say, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, Ya Raziq, Ya Razzaq, Ya Kareem. And you use that particular name suitable to your dua. So you don't say, Oh Lord, kill the enemies of Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya Ghafoor, you are forgiven. That's not right. You want to use the right name to the right dua. So Ya Qahir, Ya Most Omnipotent. So you say, Ya Qahir, and oh Lord, yeah, uh, yeah. for example, you're going to ask for mercy. Oh Allah, have mercy upon him, upon me. For verily, you are the one who takes vendetta, don't you come? And you're going to use that for that, for the sake of having mercy upon him. So you use the right name for the right supplication you're going to be doing. قال, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse, وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَاءِ and forsaken and leave, leave, abandon the ones who makes ilhad in his names. Now to leave is not to leave completely as in the sake of that uh, you don't really show them the haq and give them an advice. It's not that. Or make dua for them that they will be upon the haq. You don't leave him like this. For when you see a violin, you don't leave him on his own and oppress him. You don't leave him on oppression. So here it is actually... Uh, this is a, a, a verse to threaten those who are the ones that make it had shirk in his name. To threaten them that Allah is commanding the believers to abandon them. 
but to, to, to be associating themselves with, so, uh, uh, with them. So that is a threatening deterrence for those people making shirk. But it does not mean to us not to really have a sort of a munasaha, an advice to those people who are making shirk in his name. And the word ilhad, and the beautiful thing about the Arabic, every word has got a root for it. So ilhad is from lahd, and lahd means you tilt, you go away from. And that is why we say, for example, the one who is digging the grave this way and then going towards the qibla, it's called lahd, not chak, because it is tilted towards the qibla. So the word lahd, no word chak, when you dig the grave. Chak is the hole like that. And the lahat is we go down and then we go tilted towards what? Towards the grave. So they are tilted from the names of Allah. Ilhad means you're going away from the hat. That's what the ilhad. So the ilhad is number of types. Ilhad, which is the person he denies anything from the names of Allah or anything from the attributes that is being entailed by these names of Allah. So this is also ilhad. So you are denied. Some or all the names, and you deny some or all the attributes which are being taken from those names. The second thing which is ilhad in the names of Allah is that you affirm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a name which he did not name himself with. And you affirm to Allah an attribute, this is ilhad in his sifat, ilhad in his attribute, an attribute which is, does not belong to him. So ilhad in the names, it means number one, you deny some or all the names of Allah, or you deny some of all that is the attribute which is entailed by that name. The ilhad in the name also means that you are attributing to Allah a name which he does not attribute to himself. The third also type of ilhad is that you are affirming the name, but you are making it to entail an attribute which is not the right attribute for that name. So you say, for example, Allah Sami'un Basirun Qadir. And you say as well that Allah, also similar to the human being, He is Sami'un Basirun Qadir. So you are actually making tashbih, you are making similarity. So the third type of ilhad is to make to Allah's names an ad, uh, similarity. So you have saying, Allah is Qadir and also the human being is Qadir. Allah is Samir and also the human being is Samir. So, yes, the names look like each other, but the center of ours is not like the center of Allah. The Qutra of Allah is not the Qutra of Allah. The fourth type that the person would make it have as well is that you derive from the names of Allah a name to an idol, a statue. Like those people at the time of Quraysh, they called Allah al Uzza, taken from the names of Allah, Allah, Al Aziz. Uh, manah from the manan and so on and so forth. Right, so these are the types of ilhad in the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, the uh, other hadith, which is Ibn Abi Hatim Ibn Abbas, <coughs> Ibn Abi Hatim reported that uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said regarding the verse, uh, which is uh, who belie or means that ilhad means uh, who commits shirk. Also reported from him that they derived um, Allah and uh, from Al Ilah and Al Uzza from Al Aziz. Basically, Abdullah Ibn Abbas he says it is shirk, and he means the shirk that is we mentioned in number three and four from the types of ilhad. What is three and four? We said number three. We said that they have similarity. The names of Allah are similar to the names of the human being. Allah Qadir, human being. And the fourth one we said, that is to derive from the names of Allah, names of the statues. So they made Allah from the Ilah, al uzza from the Aziz, and we give another name, Manat from the Mannan. Okay, so as well, that is as well called Ilhan. And we have Al-A'mash, and what is from the scholars of the era of the followers, he says, and then Amash said, uh, they include in it that which is not among it. And that is the type that we have said from the third type. You remember? We said the third, uh, sorry, the second type. And that is to give a name to Allah, which Allah did not name himself with. It's also called Ilhad. 
So we're given now three types, we're given as well a fourth type, if you remember, to deny all or some of the names of Allah, or to deny some or all of the attributes that is entailed by that name. Right, so Alhamdulillah, the chapter now actually is finished, and we go to the matters. Father. Um, the important issues, first, affirming the names. And that has been taken from the verse, وَلِلَّهِ asma. So we affirm the names which Allah had affirmed for Himself, or it's been affirmed by His Prophet in an authentic way. Second. The second, the fact uh, that they are all beautiful. Husna. That means the ultimate. The ultimate. So when we say Allah Al-Mutakabbir, Allah uh, Al-Aziz. Al-Mutakabbir means the pride. He's one of His names and entails as well. And they, 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 the sifa of kibr. And kibr, the pride is for Allah, is different from the kibr for us. In us, kibr is what? Good or not bad? Or bad? Bad. bad. Whereas in Allah, kibr is good. Because kibr means self sufficient. It doesn't mean anybody. Kibr. But you, you are in need of everything. Allah has got the right to have the kibr. You don't have the right to have kibr because you are a person who is uh, actually uh, 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 is a human being. You came out from the whole. That is a hole for urination. That whether it's your father's tool for urination or your mother's tool for urination, it came from both of them. So how can you have a pride? Now coming to the third issue, and that is and the third, the order that he should be invoked therewith. And to invoke him with two things: you pour with the name Ya Allah, Ya Razak, and also the Ra'il Ibadah, which is to to know what is Ya Razak, Ya Kareem, and we have discussed that. Number four. And the fourth, uh, avoiding those who contradict it among the ignorant deniers. The ones who deny Mikhil Had, to leave them, but it's not to leave their advice. Okay, to, to, to leave their path, that's what it means. To leave their what? To follow their path, but not to, to leave them as in not to call them and make dua to them and, and to, to discuss the issue with them and try to, you know, guide them. Number five. Uh, fifth explanation of Ilhad. Ilhad. And we have given you <laughs> four types of ilhad. And number six. And the sixth, the warning for whoever commits ilhad. Which we haven't said because it's a, this is the finishing of the verse, which is not mentioned in the chapter. And that is the finishing. It says, and Those people will receive the recompense of what they have done. Okay? The recompense of what they have done. Now, Imam Ibn Rufaymin, rahimahullah, he had given us an more to this chapter as a, like a benefit. He said that the text came to threaten the person to make it had in not just the names of Allah, also in the signs of Allah. Allah says in Surah Fusil at verse number 14, <laughs> That is the ones who are making it had in our signs, they're not going to be hidden from us. So this is a threat. They're not going to be hidden from us. Wherever they're going to go, they're going to be recompensed for what they're going to be doing. They're going to be punished. So the verses of Allah, the signs of Allah are of two types, which are signs that universal, and that is all the creations like the sun and the moon and the heavens and the earth and all of that, the mountains and the trees and the animals, all of that from the universal signs of Allah. And to make ilhad in those signs is of three types. First type is that is to have the belief that other than Allah has some so, some of those signs, so that other than Allah Azza wa Jal is in control of one of these signs. Like one is in control of the clouds, one in control of the mountains, one in the control of the you know the rain at least called Qutul Qawf. You know, all of that, that's ilhad. And the second ilhad in those signs is that you believe that Allah has a partner in some or all of those ayat and signs. And the third type of ilhad is that you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a helper in creating them. So he hasn't got a partner in running them, but he's got a helper in uh, producing them and creating them. So that is as well ilhad. And the second ayat, ayat which are sharia. Ayat al-sharia, 
which is like the Quran, these are the signs, and they are from the Sharia, from the legislation. So, how do we make Ilhad in such signs? There are three types as well, and three ways of doing Ilhad in this. And that is number one, to be light. To be light, that is, to be guiding those signs, to be light the Quran, to be light the Prophet. And number two, that is, to go against it, to, to, to basically to contradict uh, whatever the ahkam it tells you, for example, don't fornicate, you fornicate. Don't sin, you sin. That's as well it had. And the third one is the alteration in whether it be uh, in the, the, the ahkam to alter it. So you say, for example, it's not pelting with a stone, it's something else. So you alter it. So basically making it had in the universal sign or the legislative or the legislation sign is to be haram. Some of it is to be kufr, like denying it, belying it. So he who belies something while he believes that Allah is the owner, Allah is the creator, then it's a kafir. And some of it is to could be like this a sin. And it could be from the major sin. Like for example, you kill somebody, you fornicate, or some of it is what it could be from the minor sins. And that is like looking at a, a woman you're not supposed to look at. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 25, And he who intends to make ilhad in the Masjid al-Haram with oppression, ghul, wrong, then we will taste, make it to taste from the severe torment or punishment. Here, Allah had called upon or named those yeah, sins to be ghul and ilhad oppression and ilhad which is tilting going away from the haq so when you make ilhad you go away from the haq and this is not to be kufr so he's talking about the sins so for better be what is incumbent upon you is to go on the straight path and he who does not go on the straight path then he made ilhad he went to tilt away from it so tilting it is not necessarily all the time kufr but some of it kufr some of it major sins and some of it is mana sins this chapter is finished, we go to chapter 52, and that is a chapter, لا يقال السلام على الله. Now, chapter 52, it should not be said, السلام unto Allah. Now, <clears throat> now this is a title which was being given by the Imam, Rahimahullah. It starts with negation, not to say. And is it not to say as for haram? or just this light. And it's more likely it is haram, as because he's gonna bring the hadith in a minute, the hadith which is from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, is to say it is haram, to say, peace be upon Allah. Because the peace has number of meaning. Peace means, uh, salam, means to welcome somebody. So you say, send my salam to somebody, send my, uh, to welcome him. The second one is actually gonna say, Salam, that means you are Salim, you are from Salama, you have, you have no de uh, deficiency in you. So when you say Salam, that means you have no deficiency, you are perfect. And Salam also, the third meaning, is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says that Malik al-Quddus, As-Salam al-Muhaymin, to the end of the verse. So when he says chapter, Chapter, the chapter does not to say, Assalamu alaikum Allah, peace be upon Allah. Don't say, peace be upon Allah. How can you say that? The peace, when you say that, is that you are saying that Allah is not complete. Because as I said, remember one of the meanings that it's not complete. So you have, salama means you are healthy, nothing wrong with you. So you say, healthy upon Allah means Allah is not healthy. Allah has got something wrong with him. That's what it means. So it's like you're calling upon Allah to uh, eliminate the deficiency in him. And that's kufr. And also, when you are saying salamu ala Allah, that is you're calling upon Allah to say salam unto himself, for verily, he cannot call himself to himself. He's the one to call him. We call upon Allah to give us the peace. Not to call Allah to give peace upon himself. And that is as well from those things which are negating the Tawheed. So what is the link for this chapter to the Tawheed? Especially the Tawheed of the attributes? It's linked because Allah's attributes are to be the ultimate and they're all husna. So Allah Azza wa Jal 
has the highest example. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So he's got the complete attribute. So when you say peace be upon Allah, you are actually uh, somehow saying Allah is incomplete, he's got deficiency, and that would negate the ultimate and the husna of his names and his attributes. Um, so this chapter linked to the one before it, because the chapter before it was to do with uh, attributing the names of Allah, which is a husna, which entails his as well attributes. And this chapter is to do with the attributes of Allah that is it's to, supposed to be safe from any deficiency in them. So they are complete and they are ultimate. For verily, ultimate and complete or completion cannot be uh, achieved except by confirming and affirming the complete attribute of Allah Azza wa and to negate whatever is opposite to it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is to be attributed by the best of the names and the best of the attributes. And when you say salamu ala Allah, you are negating that ultimate in His attributes. Coming to the hadith, in al-sahih, how is it in al-sahih? It could be sahih al-bukhari, or it could be sahih muslim, or it could be both in this, in this example, it's in both. Now, it occurs in the sahih from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that he said, Whenever we observe the prayer together with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would say, As-salam be upon Allah. Have we ever observed the Salah? Together with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yep, we say. We would say, As-salam be upon Allah from his slaves. So basically it means that whenever we are with the Prophet of Allah in the Salah, we are the Prophet of Allah in the Salah, okay? So we say, go on, peace. And as-salam be upon Allah from his slaves. Then? As-salam be upon so and so and so and so. Thereupon the Prophet Sallallahu said, Do not say as-salam unto Allah, for Allah is as-salam. Right. So here it looks like the obligatory prayer, because the usually with the Prophet of Allah uh, in congregation with the obligatory prayer, not the voluntary prayer. That when we're with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we say Make it tashahud. We say what? Assalamu ala Allah. And that's wrong. And he said, Salamu ala Allah from his, what? from his slaves. So we are saying, Salamu ala Allah. Oh Allah, Salamu alaik. From his slaves. They think it's right. Even their ignorance did not save them from that uh, correction from the Prophet. So the Prophet, Sallam, he would save them from his sin because he didn't know. But he cannot save them from the correction. He has to tell them this is wrong. So he said to them, This is wrong. Don't say Salamu ala Allah. But well, when Allah is the peace, and at the same time they said, we used to say, As-salamu ala fulani wa fulani, peace be upon so and so and so and so. As-salamu ala nabi. So the Prophet ﷺ did not correct the second. He corrected the what? The first. So the second is correct, but the first is not wrong. So when you say, As-salamu ala Allah, peace be upon Allah, from his slaves, you are calling health to Allah. To be safe from the deficiencies. So how can you ask Allah to save himself from the deficiency? You don't, even if you don't mean it, even if you don't mean it, but the, the wording, that's what it means. So, <clears throat> in, that, in that sense, the Prophet said, don't say, As-salamu ala Allah. Now, the other, which is As-salamu, when he said, As-salamu ala fulan wa fulan, peace be upon so and so and so and so, this narration came in Sahih al-Bukhari, As-salamu ala Jibreel wa Mika'il. Peace be upon Jibreel and Mikai. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say this is wrong. He left it as permissible to say salam upon the angels. Because the Prophet of Allah did not prohibit them from saying that. Right, now we're going to the end of the chapter, which is the issues. Now, the important issues, the first is a meaning of a salam. Salam is from the names of Allah. It means the one who is salim saved from the deficiencies and in terms of its being uh, a welcoming greeting salam it means that is that the name of allah is upon you it means the name of allah is the one who is a salam upon you and it means as well that is from saying salamu alaikum i i ask allah to save you i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you safe at the same time second one 
And second, that it is um, a form of greeting. And that is what you said, welcoming, number three. Third one, that it is not suitable to Allah. Because it is haram, number four. Number four, uh, fourth is the reason for that. And the reason for that is because Allah is the peace, is the salam. And we've explained it, number five. And the fifth, they've been um, uh, taught the salutation that befits Allah. So the, the continuation of this hadith, which we haven't mentioned, is that if one of you prays, then let him say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat as-salamu ala nabi. You understand me? So the continuation of this hadith is to show them the shahur. So here it shows them how Prophet of Allah was good in teaching. He told them this is wrong and this is the alternative. So when he told them why it is wrong, it's good because it's got lots of benefit. When you tell somebody this is wrong, you tell them why, then the person who's listening, he will have more comfortable, he will be more comfortable to believe what, what you're saying because you tell them why, not just to say, khalas, don't do it. So if you don't, don't, don't do it, you tell them why, the person is not really more relaxed and comfortable. So when you can tell them why, the reason, because he said, Allah is the peace. You can't say, peace be upon Allah. So that is, as I said, uh, to clarify the misconception in the person's heart. And also, it tells us that the second benefit from this, when you tell somebody why you should not do this and why you should do that, is that to show that how Sharia is absolved from any deficiency. That means all its commands and prohibition is linked to wisdom. There is a reason behind it. It's not just like that. And the third issue as well that you learn, that whenever you have similar issues to it, you could be able to use a similar argument to as well run the same rule on it. So when you tell them why, so you have any other issues that's got the same why, the same reason, then you implement the rules, the rules that Allah's Messenger had implemented because it got the similar what? Causes, similar reasons, similar why it is being prohibited or being commanded. Is that understood? Okay. So... <clears throat> Here we find that is when the Prophet said that told him why we got the benefit is that is he had uh, uh, this shows how the Prophet was a good teacher. Also shows how was a good teacher is that when he told them not to do it, he gave them alternative, and it's very it's very good to give them an alternative. Okay, uh, from this hadith we learn that we should not stay quiet if there is something wrong. Prophet said so something wrong, he corrected it. He said, don't say salamu ala Allah. Okay, it's incumbent upon a Muslim and upon the scholars to clarify the, 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 the sharia and the laws to the people and tell them this is haram, this is halal, regardless of what you fear from the consequences. So you should tell them haram, unless you think if I tell them it's going to lead to more haram, there's something else. But how can you, you know, draw the line? How can you draw the line? 53. Chapter 53. <coughs> The, say, the saying, O oh Allah, forgive me if you so wish. Right, this is the chapter uh, to show the full sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His completeness and His perfection. And this is from the attribute of perfection. When you say Allahumma, that means O oh Allah. Um, and this is a word that we use only for every time that we beseech Allah Azza wa oh Allahumma. It's ighfirli, that is, forgive for me. Forgive via maghfira, it means to hide my sin uh, uh, and not to exceed it. Because it's from the word al maghfir al maghfir which is the uh, sorry, which is the helmet that would protect the person's head when he fights the enemies. From that word, ufra uh, means hide my sins, O Lord. And Allah Azza wa Jalla on the day of resurrection, when he confronts his slave, he would say to him, For very me, these are your sins. Do you deny them? No. He said, Not just I have concealed them and hid them for you. In this dunya, I'm hiding them for you in the afterlife. And that is from the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jalla on his slaves. Just like I didn't like people to know about your sins, which you do between four walls, then I'm going to forgive them for you. I'm not going to give you as well to, uh, to be a scandal. Uh, imagine the Jannah. And you enter it, and everybody else had heard what you've done. And generally, you don't, you've been doing this in the dunya, you've been doing that in the dunya. No, he had hidden that for you for the dunya, and he will hide that for you in the akhirah. And he says, in shit. So he needs to dry, he says, Oh Lord, forgive for me if you wish. Now, that is when you say, If you wish. Is that correct or not? Let's see the hadith. Now, 
Because he said, that chapter to say Allahumma Is it haram or is it halal? The author just made it like this. We're going to see what does he mean. Is it wrong or right? We're going to arrive to the conclusion it's wrong. Let's see what the hadith says. It is contained in the Sahih from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Now this Sahih here means Bukhari and Muslim here. As I said, sometimes Bukhari, so sometimes Muslim, sometimes both. Now, uh, from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one among you should say, O oh Allah, forgive me if you so wish. O oh Allah, shower mercy on me if you so wish. He should be determined in his supplication. Allah has not anything to compel him. Right. Muslim so we know from this hadith, that is, uh, the Muslim. In, in the Muslim's version, uh, he should be firm in his crave. Nothing is too big for Allah. He, he gives it. Firm? firm in his no, crave. No, no. Well, you have the Rabbah, that means let him uh, magnify his request. That means let him ask more. So if you ask him, don't ask the ultimate. So for example, you ask in Jannah, oh, Allah, give me the what? The al highest. Well, you have the Rabbah. So let him make it more. For value, nothing more for Allah. Not, 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 nothing Allah will. Nothing will make Allah incapable of fulfilling what you asked. That's what it means. Right. So the Prophet sallallahu he said, "La yakul ahadukum." This is that the chapter now means that you're not supposed to say that. Oh Lord, forgive me, if you wish. Because he said to him, said the Prophet, he said, "La yakul." Not one of you to say as a prohibition. Allahumma khfirli. Oh Lord, forgive for me if you wish. O oh Allah, have mercy upon me, if you wish. Let him be, he says determined, mean let him be affirmative. Affirm. So let him be a sort of um, uh, determined and not just determined as well, let him be affirmed and st st staying with power. I want this. But Allah, there's nothing can compel him to do something that he doesn't want to do. So, this is to show why you're not supposed to say Allahumma firli in shit or oh, forgive me uh, if you wish because it's got three things which are wrongs. Number one is you're giving a hint that Allah has somebody compelling him, that you are compelling Allah, you are demanding Allah and Allah has no option except to fulfill what you have demanded him to do. So you are giving a hint that there is somebody can really prevent him from giving you what you ask for, okay? So if you say to him, I'm not going to push you, O oh Lord, okay, I'm not going to push you, forgive me if you wish. That's what he means, that's why it's haram. So if you forgive me, if you don't want to give me, because I'm not going to push you, because you, maybe you are compelled, you are under pressure, O oh Lord. Second issue is that when you say, if you wish, it's like you're saying that that thing you're asking is too much for Allah to fulfill. It's like, uh, I think I've asked you too much. And that's why I'm going to say to you, O oh Lord, if you wish. So if you think it's too much, you could leave it. And that is why he said in Sayyid Muslim, let him go to his maximum. Not that you think, oh, I'm not going to ask that much because maybe Allah will not be able to fulfill it. No, go to the ultimate. For when Allah, there's nothing, you know, would make him incapable of fulfilling whatever he wants to give you. So, لِيَعْضِ مَا رَغْبَ وَلِيُعْضِ مَا رَغْبَ so let him ask whatever he wants, whether it's too much or little. Okay, you don't say, "Oh, it's too much for me to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala." Okay. And the third issue is that, which is not really as well prohibited when you say that, is that you are actually giving a hint that you don't care. So if you wish, that means I, I, I'm not concerned whether you're going to forgive me or not, because I'm self-sufficient and I don't really have, uh, I don't have the need. <laughs> For you to forgive me. That's giving a hint as well when you say that. Okay, so this is why you're not supposed to say, Oh Lord, forgive me if you wish. Oh Lord, have mercy upon me if you wish, because of the three things. So you think that Allah is compelled to do something that He doesn't want to do? Number two is actually you think that is whatever you're asking, it may be too much for Allah, that's why you're saying if you wish. And number three, that is you are giving a hint that you're not concerned, you're not even bothered what that's going to give you. The forgiveness or the mercy or not. Okay? That is why you call upon Allah with affirmative. Forgive me, O Lord. Have mercy upon my Lord. Right. Now, what about the response of Allah? Fulfilling your supplication. 
Should I be as well can affirm that I mean I am hundred percent that Allah will fulfill what I've asked him for. So we say that if you are talking about the capability of Allah, you should be assured. So you have to be affirmed and believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of fulfilling what you've asked for. But in terms of your supplication is going to be fulfilled, it's going to be, that is, uh, maybe you would say that Allah will not give it to me because I, I, I'm, I'm a sinner. You know, I don't deserve it. Uh, that's no problem. He's saying that there's something, you know, you know, so you have hesitation, okay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it to you because you are not good enough. We would say that's allowed, but it's not good. You have to have what? Husn al-dhan. Good opinion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahsin al So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might overlook all that sins of yours and give you. And give you what you want to ask. What you've asked. Okay? So you have to have ihsan al-dhan billah. Good opinion. So even though that you believe maybe you're not going to be fulfilled because you don't deserve it, you're a bad person, you... You know, how many sins I've done, that's why Allah doesn't fulfill it. No, have a good fun. Good fun, even if you are a sinner. So you say that Allah doesn't fulfill it. So have good fun in Allah. But remember in your dua, you have to be as well realistic. You don't ask something which is haram. Oh Lord, suffer my kingship with my sister, or my mother, or my father. You can't ask haram. So you have to be as well realistic in your dua. You can't ask haram from Allah. O oh Lord, have oppression upon them like they have oppression upon me. How can you do that? Yeah, Allah cannot have oppression. You could have, O oh Lord, make vendetta, vendetta for me, uh, revenge, but not to oppress them like they oppress me. How can you make us Allah to ask Allah to oppress them? So, dhulm means doing something which is wrong. Also, you're asking something which is not realistic, like saying, O oh Lord, make me a prophet or make me an angel. I want to be an angel. Okay. That's not right as well. Play Another question? Father, give me calls, sir. Because I don't give. You're a new customer. <laughs> and I don't give you the question to the person sitting at the back. Now. Okay, but you said about uh, that when you see something wrong, you should say something like something. Yeah, but he said, behind me, a machine. He said that when you see something wrong, you should say it as Hanan, yes. So it's uh, same on the non Muslim? It depends. That's it. I'm just saying, you should say it's haram. This could be from the heart, the weakest iman. Or it could be the tongue, which is stronger iman. And it could be with the hand, and it's the strongest. So the situation depends. So if I see somebody who is, like, for example, a disbeliever, and he's doing like, like some of these, uh, you know, putting a big mustache. I've seen one, wallahi, I can't forget him. I was in a service station. On the motorway, when I saw him, I went to the toilet and then I put him back to go to, actually, I put him back to going back, not to, to go to the toilet because I want to see him again. Is he a or not? Because I've seen mustaches, but not like this. It's coming inside. And he's eating. How can he eat? I don't know. Because he needs two, two spoons, I say. One spoon to lift the mustache and the spoon, the second one to go inside. I said, Alhamdulillah, I put the deen. So, if I see such person, I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to say to him, out of curiosity, why are you putting this mustache? And I'm like, well, I believe it's wrong because my God told me this is wrong. And as well, intellectually speaking, rationally speaking, that is not going to be helpful to your food. I mean, I don't feel comfortable if you eat from the same plate that I'm eating with because you're putting your hairs in it. You know, when you go to a restaurant, if you have a single hair in the food, that's it. So you're having, you dipping all that. Imagine you're going to drink a stew or a soup from the same boil that I've been drinking. I don't know what sort of germs and virus is going to be there. So, Prophet of Allah is an example we call him. He had seen two people as messengers from Kisra, Khosos. They had no beard and they had a big mustache. So he said straight away, Who commanded you doing this? He said, Our Lord. Our Lord means Kisra because they treat him as a god. He said, as for my Lord commanded me to trim my moustache and let go my beard. The opposite. That's his now. So he told him this is wrong. He's now. He's started with this. So it, it depends on how you start your deen. And I remember I said in this, in this uh, uh, gathering, the circle, a long time ago maybe, 
that the person, when the Prophet وسلم, he said to Ali Nabi Talib, soon as you come to the fortresses of Khaybar, and let me the first thing to call him, because there are the people of the book, La ilaha illallah. Now, you are the da'ya, you start, start to develop more tools which are good for the da'wah. So if you think that this person, if he comes to the Islam, but as soon as he finds out something particular in that deen, he will leave the deen, then you start with that before you start with the da'wah of that. So there's a woman here, she's arguing about men for women, one for one. So she's going to embrace Islam and she didn't find out later on that we're allowed to marry four. She might abandon the deen. That would have started, but by the way, you know, we as Muslims, we believe the male are allowed to four. I'm not saying every male should have four, they're allowed up to four. Just before you enter the Islam, you might what? Leave the Islam. Because we don't want somebody to come to the deen and leave out. To come to the deen and stay in the deen. I remember in High Wicked, in my masjid, there was a person, for a month I'm seeing him coming to fight. MashaAllah! So out of curiosity, he's an imam, said, Brother, MashaAllah, have you seen him? Are you Muslim? He said, I'm not a Muslim. He comes to every fighter. He's not a Muslim. I said, well, Why is that? He said, I'm trying the hardest thing in the deen before I embrace it. For him, the hardest thing is what? But he came to the fighter, MashaAllah, and then he embraced Islam. After Islam, he doesn't come to Fatah as he used to be before Islam. <laughs> so before, before Islam, MashaAllah, 100%. After he embraced Islam, I think he missed out with those Muslims who are lazy, not coming to the Fatah. <laughs> so he was trying the hardest thing. <laughs> Wait. There was a person who was so close to the deen, Alhamdulillah, he embraced Islam. But they even specified, but does anything for me in the area in the restaurant downstairs to talk to him. I talked to him for half an hour. And every time I say, I know, it doesn't make me continue, I know, I know, I know. So what are you waiting for everything I know? He stops me, I know, I know, I know. He said, I don't know. I said, how do you guarantee you're going to leave? He said, I know a lie from here. So everything that I'm going to say, he knows it. How do you guarantee you're going to live until you say the When did they win? Uh, the only thing I could do is just bring to half of you, my brother. But alhamdulillah, later when I asked about it, he said, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. He knows everything. Aqeedah, Tawheed, Rububiyyah, everything. He read books and he, he knows about the, who he brings Islam, Mark Tyson and all of that. He knows them. But there's something there. Alhamdulillah, as I said, he embraces Islam. He said, no one embraces Islam after they go to Egypt or something, or they go to a Muslim country. He said, alhamdulillah. Why? Yeah. So Sikhara is mentioned in the book by Sheikh Ibn Adhim. I can bring it because but the Sikhara has nothing to do with if you wish. No, if you know. There's no something you fish. So that's why I didn't bring it because I don't want to cause uh, uh, confusion amongst you. So that is Sikhara is that, Oh Lord, if you know this is good for me, then do it. It's nothing to do if you wish, as in if you don't capable of doing it. So I'm leaning this to your knowledge. Oh Lord, make me to live if you know that the life is good for me. This is it. You are extreme situation. You don't say that dua when you are healthy. No, you are ill, so ill. So you are now desperate. And the pain is so much. You say, oh Lord, make me to die if death is good for me. And make me to live if life is good. So I'm leaving it for your knowledge. I'm not saying that if you wish without. No, I'm saying if you will, if, you, uh, if, if it is according to your knowledge, it's better for me. Whereas the other one, if you wish, it's, it's hints that Allah is not capable of doing it, and, or Allah is being compelled to do it, or you are not even caring about the God. That's different. No, I'm coming to the God with my help. I'm asking Allah. But I'm saying that this whole thing which I want to do it. Okay. I don't know if it's good for me or not. So you're not asking about like the mercy, oh Lord, mercy. Have mercy upon me if you know mercy is good for me. Huh? You don't say that, do you? Oh Lord, forgive for me. If you think forgiveness is good for me, forgive for me. What are you talking about? Forgiveness is good for you. But I want to marry this wife. I want to buy this car. I want to purchase this house. I don't know if that wife or that car or that house is good for me. Oh Lord, if you know this house is good for me, this woman is good for me, this car is good for me, make that for me. And he's saying, and he's saying to her, Make it. You don't say, 
Give it to me if you wish. Now, if you knew this is good, then give it to me. Huh? So there's, a, there's, there's a affirmation here. There's a determination. There's no hesitation. But I'm going to see if you know this is good, then give it to me. But you don't say, for example, Oh Lord, have mercy upon me if you know that mercy is good for me. What, what is that? It's a nonsense. That's nonsense in the dua. Have mercy upon me if you think mercy is good for me. And oh Lord, take away hellfire from me if you, make, if you think hellfire is no good for me. Oh Allah, enter, make me enter paradise if you think paradise is good for me. I mean, that is not, that doesn't work. Do you understand that? Is it not derogative and wrong to use the word if you know to Allah? Allah knows. No, no. No, I am asking it's not because as derogative, which is like saying, uh, I'm saying, oh Lord, you have no knowledge. So, uh, uh, if you have the knowledge, then do it. If you have the knowledge, no, I'm not saying this. I'm saying, O oh Lord, إِنِّي أَسْتَخِيرُكَ بِعِلْمِكَ وَأَسْتَقْدِرُكَ بِقُدْرَتِكَ وَأَسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضْلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ If you know, and you know, and this is good for me, then your knowledge, O oh Lord, implement it to help me to determine my thing. I'm not saying that this is an Arabic language. In English, it doesn't work. In English, it means maybe he doesn't know. That's what it means. No. So, the Prophet وسلم, he said, لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد. If Fatima to from Muhammad is to steal, does the Prophet well, think that the Fatima will steal? So, this is we call it intina intina. I don't understand that word for you. Uh, that intina intina. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, if you know that it's not going to happen, that Allah will not know. In Arabic, it hasn't got that problem. In English, it has. Do you understand that? So when he said, if Fatima is going to steal, he knows the Prophet of Fatima is going to steal. But this is the impossible. Okay, now. Is that question? Before Ahmed, yeah, Ahmed, yeah, Ahmed. I said that 200 times. If you understand, say, I was, when he was talking to me, I was thinking about the uncle. I was, and somebody, please, I said to you, brothers, and I said to the brother, where is he? That's you. The last time. Please. I mean, for the sake of uncle, remind me. I mean, I forget. Because uncle is sitting on that side. So he's got the right to start the question. Wallahi, I've been, from the first one, he wanted to go to India, he made me forget. He made me forget. He's going to make me forget. Sorry, uncle, for that. It's your students who are the ones that are the culprits. No, 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 no. no. You do have the right to question, but you have the right to stop. Prophet said, Captain, when these two people came to talk about the story of the king of well, the brother of one of them, the brother is the younger, and the person who is not a brother is not even a relative, he's the older. So the brother of that killed one uncle, he's, according to what we believe, he's got more right to speak to the prophet about the king of his brother. <coughs> so as soon as he wanted to talk about it, he said, Kaber. Let the person who's older than you speak, even if they've got nothing to do with the relationship with that person. Captain. So we have to understand the etiquette if somebody's older, he's got the first question to have. Number one, because maybe he's got no time to sit, he's tired, uh, he's got no uh, whatever. So the reason has to be. So I, as a human being, when I talk, I forget. So please remind me of what. Salam, Shaykh. I've heard people saying, and so, and a brothers closed the Oh, sorry. I just opened it and closing. Opening and closing. <laughs> when somebody says Assalamu alaikum, the other person answers Alaikum Salam. He doesn't say why. That's number one. So saying Alaikum Salam, no problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. Yes. Second one. Second one is somebody's has been talking to a group of people and then he said, I'm going, Ma Salama. He used the word Ma Salama. Ma Salama means, I mean, may Allah give you safety. No problem. No. But even when he goes, he should say, Salamu Alaikum as well. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Mathaniyah, or Mal'ula, awla min al-thani. That is the first salutation. It hasn't got the, uh, you know, the priority to forget about the second one. First one is when you meet him. Second one, when you leave him. So the second one does not have less 
importance than the first one. Prophet said, the priority goes to both. Just like you are eager to say salam when you see, you say salam when you leave, when you depart. Both of them are to be compulsory, inshallah. Okay, Uncle? Anything else? Father. Now. Ferrero, you have any questions? <laughs> Sorry. Allahu, Allahu. Allah, Allah means, Allah means the name of Allah. Who? Him. Allahu. But they make it as a white one name. Uh, it sounds like hallelujah. <laughs> okay, these people, they believe, before I give them now a help, I give them a help, but it's not the right help, wrong help. They believe that mentioning Allah, the, the name of Allah, a number of times, is going to give them more closeness to Allah. That's what they believe. These are the more general people. So we say to them, okay, is what you're saying ibadah or not ibadah? If they say it's ibadah, then alhamdulillah, it's not adah, it's not like something from the dunya, it's from the deen, because you get getting close to Allah. Now every ibadah has to fulfill the conditions. Sincerity, and I'm sure that inshallah I'm not going to be sincere because you're sincere, you're shaking your head 24 hours, I don't know how long. So maybe sincere. But the second is that you follow the Prophet. So did you follow the Prophet? If you follow him, I will follow him like this. I will shake him in the morning. I will jump if you wish. If you see the Prophet jumping, I'll jump. If he shakes, I'll shake. So if you, if you are sincere, I'm not going to concern about myself and my sincerity. I'm sure maybe you're sincere. Even the ones who are Buddhist, they're the sincere in their ibad as well. But are they doing the right, correct thing or not? That's the question, big question. So can you give me from the Prophet ﷺ that he used to do this dhikr? Ya Latif, 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 that three, one thousand times. Or Allah, 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 You might even say, you know what something when I say it? I get into that mode. Huh? Into that mode, it's like I'm flying with Allah <laughs> I don't know, okay, is there any difference between saying Allah, 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 monkey, 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 one thousand times? Same thing again, the same thing. Because when you start saying something for a long time, you get dizzy. You're not different between these people who say Krishna, 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 Krishna. You know the people who are Krishna, 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 Krishna. Same thing. It's not different. So basically, your feelings, what you feel when you say something, it will not going to legalize. I am saying to you, if the Prophet of Allah left, don't you believe that the Prophet of Allah left for us nothing that will get us closer to paradise, that he had commanded us with, and left us nothing that will get us close to the hellfire that he had prohibited us from doing? Yes, you should see that. Then he had taught us even how to go to the toilet. Toilet matters. So you tell me, where is the touch of the Prophet of Allah? Because if you said this is good, then I'm going to say the Prophet of Allah had fallen short not to show you that way that you have just discovered. Which is he saying this? I'm going to say to you, well, the Prophet of Allah really, he did not, you know, he was really betrayed, he betrayed us. Not to tell us about your way. Or you are accusing even worse, Allah the Almighty, as our Jal, yeah, is not really good enough to send us the Prophet of Allah. Or even worse, you're causing, accusing yourself to be a god, or giving a new Sharia for us. So be careful. So, I'm going to give you help, as I said, I'm not going to help, but I'm going to, they might say, and they maybe haven't said because they're ignorant. There's a hadith akhir in the Prophet of Allah. And he says, Prophet of Allah, he said, Lantakum as sa'ad, sa'a will not take place until there will be nobody on the face of the earth who would say, Allah, Allah. Not the same Muslim. Allah, double, Allah. See, look, Allah, Allah. So the hour will not take place until there will be nobody saying that means we have to say Allah, Allah, Allah. Because that means a bad sign, Allah, Allah. I said, okay. Before I tackle this, so this is Allah, Allah. So why do you say Latif, 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 Latif? So that's wrong. So you say Latif, 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 and a thousand times. So stick to Allah, 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 Allah. Why is it Allahu, 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 Allahu? Yaqib <laughs> Salafi. Allah, 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 Allah. That's number two. So two things. Latif, Latif, Allahu, Allahu. Number three, the knockout. 
For first of all, not the the knockout, the knockout is the last one. Number three, the Prophet said the same hadith, which is the same narration. He said there will be nobody saying, La ilaha illallah. So Allah alone is what? La ilaha illallah. And the knockout, which is the fourth thing, and that is, if it is Allah, Allah, where is in the hadith or the action of the companions that they used to sit to say, Allah, Allah? There isn't. So you are interpreting the hadith the way that you want. You have invented this way, elevated this way, and then you looked into the sharia to something to help. Oh, yes! Okay? Like that person was a, it's a joke. But uh, this person who was saying everything in the Quran, everything in the Islam, regardless of what you say is mentioned in the Quran, one person was a disbeliever said, What are you talking about? Everything in the Quran. My name is Mr. Cook. Where is that in the Quran? He said, Oh, there is. What? What did I cook a car in the <laughs> Verse of the Jumma. <laughs> it did I cook? Because there's a cook there. <laughs> so he mentioned, uh, Subhanallah. Subhanakallah, Bihamdik, Ashadullah, Safrullah, Kalatullah.